Ladies and gentlemen, meine Damen und Herren, um, please allow me, you know, that or be seated so that we can start. Um, I think that some people are still on the way here to uh, our meeting room here. My name is uh, Johannes Ludewig, uh, the um, um, executive director of CER. So I'm very happy, I think, to welcome you here. Um, the reason that, that I'm speaking here and is simply that the ITF has um, asked CR half a year ago um, uh, to organize, I think, this uh, uh, panel discussion, so to speak, as the contribution of the railway sector, I think, to the um, uh, ITF um, uh, annual uh, forum here this year, here in uh, Leipzig. And, um, okay, you know the uh, overall um, uh, issue, the um, orientation, the leitmotiv of the um, um, this year's annual conference is Transport for a Global Economy, Challenges and Opportunities in the Downturn. So we have asked ourselves, you know, what, um, how can we discuss this issue uh, from a, a railway, I think, point of view. So what could be the contribution and the role, I think, of the railways in such an overall, I think, uh, uh, situation. So we all are aware that we are in a in a, in a difficult economic, I think, situation, people talking about economic and financial crisis. What we are seeing also is that a little bit, I think, the other crisis about which we have discussed a lot uh, before, I think, the uh, financial crisis, I think, uh, started, I think, to have an impact on our day-to-day -day life uh, was the question of environment and climate change. So, for the moment, everybody is talking about the economic issues and not so much about the environmental and climate change situation, but nevertheless, this situation is also there. So we have both, I think, issues uh, on the agenda, the economic financial situation, and still also the challenge, I think, of environment and climate change. So, and the question we have asked ourselves in such a situation, what could be the contribution, I think, of the railways, and what could governments, I think, do in such a situation? Um, taking, I think, into account both problems and how do we have to react, I think, in a way that we are dealing uh, efficiently and successfully with uh, uh, both problems. So that is, I think, here the issue of the first, I think, panel discussion uh, we are having here, uh, I think, today. And so how do we bring together solving economic problems and at the same time doing something for the sustainability of our economic structure, of the transport structure, as we have that not only in Europe, but I think on a worldwide basis. So we are very happy, I think, to have a panel. I think here uh, Mr. Theon, who is the moderator, will present to you the participants in a few minutes. We will also have the Swiss Minister of Transport, Bundesrat uh, Moritz Leuenberger, who will join us in a few minutes. He has, of course, as a good Minister of Transport, taken the train, I think, to come here to Leipzig. And he was also, this train was punctual, but he had a meeting with the German Minister for Environment before. So uh, he will arrive, uh, or is now in, the, uh, I think he has already arrived two minutes ago, and is now on his way from uh, the central station here. So he will join us, I think, in about 15 minutes. And then also, as soon as here, I think, making his uh, a statement. So. This is the first panel. The second one is then we have a coffee break, of course, and after the coffee break, we have our second panel, which is then asking, I think, for in a more uh, specific, uh, I think, way, uh, global transport governance, realizing the potential of rail. So in the first panel, to say, okay, what has to happen, what could happen, I think, to take into account these two challenges and crises, economic and sustainability, and then in the second one, what could be more specific, the contribution, I think, uh, uh, of the railways, I think, in such an environment. And um, we know, you know, uh, we in Europe, we, uh, the railways have been developed very much on a national basis. And there are very many obstacles, I think, going from one country to the next one. And this is a problem because the strong part, particularly on freight transport of the railway system, is going for long distances. If you go to the United States, Russia, China, India, you see that the strong part of the railway, particularly on freight, is the long distance. And what can we do in Europe, maybe, to improve this? So this is, I think, then the second uh, panel here, 
uh, which we will have after the uh, coffee break. And uh, also the chairman of CR, uh, Sir Mauro Moretti, the CEO of the Italian Railways, will participate in the second panel and at the end also uh, making some concluding uh, remarks. So, uh, so far I think my uh, few introductory remar remarks. Again, uh, welcome I think to everybody here to this uh, forum, also to this city of Leipzig. I hope you have also some time to see a little bit from this of this wonderful uh, city. And uh, I have now the pleasure to hand over the floor, I think, to uh, uh, Friedrich Thielen, the moderator of our first panel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Ludwig, uh, um, there you are. Welcome uh, to everyone here from, from the chair. Uh, have you have heard our uh, prominent minister, Moritz uh, Leuenberg, is still on the road, so we, I start with uh, uh, introducing all the panelists except for him, and we, we then would also start the, the discussion. We couldn't sit around here waiting until he arrives, but when he arrives, I think we make a short uh, uh, break in the discussion. He delivers his speech and then we continue. As to proceed here, I, I, uh, I uh, propose that everyone of the guest speakers here, the participants on the panel, is going to give a four to five minutes, as I understand, short introduction in hit, into what he is going to propose and to demand. And I ask all the, uh, first to keep to the time, but second to put um, up something, uh, uh, well, a bit controversial. Otherwise, we could all sing in, in choir or in chorus that uh, uh, railways are good and need state subvention and uh, they're green and they're much better than anything else. But if we do that, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But if we do that, uh, well, uh, we're missing something of a chance to discuss that there are other aspects to it. Okay. Uh, and after that sort of short uh, 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 contribution of our panelists, then I, I propose we have a discussion among uh, the panel. And then uh, the audience is by all means asked to participate, come up with very controversial, uh, controversial questions. And we, the, uh, those questions will then be answered by here. So now to the uh, panelists. Francisco José Cardoso dos Reis, on my left hand, is the President Caminhos do Ferro Português, but this is the Portuguese Railways, translated into English. One further on, Eberhard von Körber, Vice Chairman of the Club of Rome, known for a long uh, uh, period in German industries, ASEAN, Brown, Bavaria, Swedish industries, he's been on the board of almost, uh, well, even he's been with Toyota, as I understand. He's been with the enemy uh, for some time. Uh, and uh, so we will hear probably other uh, opinions as well. Then Michael Klausecker, he uh, is sort of stepping in for James Drummond, as I understand, who unfortunately couldn't make it here, but uh, uh, the Director General of Unif Unif Unifi or Unifi 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 is def definitely um, uh, representing him most fantastically. Then Bert Kleck on, on the right hand side is uh, CEO of Pro Rail, but is also. Uh, uh, president of the European Infrastructure Manager. So, well, that is something very important and useful. And, uh, well, and the voice which should be in infrastructure, that's it's what railways are about. At least that's what we talk about here today. Well, let, let's con uh, start with my left hand side. You got the floor for five minutes. Please press on, uh, on the main button there. Okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try uh, to say more than the usual that uh, we say, as you, you suggest. Uh, first of all, uh, a statement which uh, is uh, some, something like this. Uh, I think it is impossible to achieve the objectives that the uh, European Union establishes for uh, reduction of emissions if the railway sector is not an important part of doing this. Um, all the, the, the compromises that have been done, like the 20% of reducing emissions uh, or um, the, the compromises of uh, new energetic, energetic efficiency, um, 
they, they are not going to be achieved if the railway sector will not be, uh, we will not um, do a different role in the future. And how can we do a different role in the future? How can we participate in these changes? Uh, we have to, to catch the opportunity that we have today with an economical crisis, uh, with unemployment, uh, and uh, if, as we are doing in Portugal, we do a bigger investment in railways, we can achieve the objective of increase the, the economical activity, uh, split uh, the transportation from one part to other, which is more efficiency, uh, has more efficiency, and uh, create new conditions of operation in terms of transportation in the future. We all know that um, we have problems, namely in the south, southern countries of Europe, of productivity, namely in terms of freight. Our trains are not so bigger than in Central Europe. We can't compete with, uh, with road uh, as an equal uh, because our trains have 400 meters, uh, not 750 or 1,000 meters. So uh, what we can offer is, is, uh, is not so cheaper uh, as we uh, could. So we need a big investment in terms of infrastructures. We have to construct uh, not only new high-speed lines, but also we have to uh, have a consistent uh, conventional line uh, to offer, namely in terms of freight, uh, new proposals to the markets. In terms of passengers, uh, we have also to promote uh, new investment in terms of equipment, uh, rolling stock or infrastructures. Because as all we all us know, in the future we have, we continue to have bigger cities, namely in the south. Uh, when you have the, 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 the phenomenon of construction high speed in Spain or in Portugal, uh, cities, uh, they continue to to have a growth, an important growth. So uh, those link in terms, in ter internally uh, uh, in the cities will continue growing. So, and we have to, to split that uh, use of transportation to trains. There are some proposals that I, I can, can uh, sh uh, say what, what they are. Uh, in a, a more precise way. We have to, to award the transport uh, people that uh, have good solutions. Uh, the principle of uh, bonus malus, uh, I think it is very important to put in place. We have to award those we, that decrease uh, the emissions. We have to award those who get more efficient uh, services. Uh, as, as an example, uh, the Portuguese Railways uh, last week uh, put out a tender to buy 102 new trains, 72 uh, electric multiple units and 30 diesel multiple units. Our compromise in terms of emission re reductions will be something like 35% in passengers and 80% in freight. So this is what we can do in, in realistic terms. It's investing, uh, generating a new uh, economical basis in terms of uh, transportation and introduce more efficiency. And I will end uh, telling that a health economy is firmly linked with the transport, uh, a health transport of system of transportation. So 
that's our 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 job in the next years and our, our i think we'll we'll gain this this uh, Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Cardoso dos Reis, now the floor is yours, Eva von Kerber, please. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, from the Club of Rome's point of view, we are looking at a triple challenge, which is in itself interconnected when we uh, look at the present economic downturn or financial crisis as one of uh, uh, our challenges and at the energy and uh, peak oil situation where energy supply, energy supply security is at risk and where we have reached peak oil globally and um, uh, have to deal with this. And thirdly, when I talk triple challenge, it's the climate change situation. And what we cannot do is to move from one uh, issue to the next one. Uh, they're interconnected and they have to be addressed uh, jointly. And uh, we are very glad to see that at the G20 conference on the 3rd of April in London and most probably also at the G8 plus 5 summit in Italy later this year, there is a consensus that all these three challenges have to be looked at in connection as an interconnected and interrelated cluster of issues. Having said that, I want to quickly focus now uh, more on the environmental, uh, the climate change component of this triple challenge and also on what uh, President Obama has called the green recovery uh, at the recent London G20 conference. Now, I see or we see this present crisis as a real once-in-a-time opportunity um, and use the stress use uh, the understanding and society for the present situation, uh, use also the anger and the disappointment uh, for a change in our global agenda uh, under the headline uh, that there is no return to the status quo possible and acceptable. There is a different agenda uh, ready uh, to decide on and to follow through. And uh, we see this in two directions. Uh, this opportunity, one is that um, the over four trillion dollars of economic stimulus programs at national and global levels, uh, which are uh, now in principle decided but not yet fully allocated, um, that uh, these investments provide a unique opportunity uh, for a new agenda, which also relates, of course, to what we discuss here, the world of railways. And the second aspect is the involvement of the private sector. Now, all this is public money or publicly guaranteed money, um, but no solutions on a global scale are possible without a deep involvement of the private sector. This is very often under uh, estimated and overlooked uh, by government and also by the media, in particular in the present discussion where at management level uh, things have gone wrong and uh, there is a sentiment of discounting this sector to a certain extent. So whatever we do uh, at government level or at public level has to be uh, also an incentive to include the private sector as an investor or as an operator. Having said that, um, my, my conclusion on this particular issue is we must not miss this great opportunity uh, with these enormous amounts at stake uh, and uh, uh, allow that they are only spent under short-term aspects. And this takes me to railways because the main argument why a bigger amount, I will come to the figures in a second, to railways is not in these budgets is that they are not shovel-ready, as they call it, that uh, these investments uh, are uh, only in terms of employment and contrib contribution to national growth of medium to long-term relevance. But saying this means uh, that there is a mistake in thinking that the whole economic recovery stimulus is a short-term exercise. No, it is not. If we want to meet these triple challenges, 
they have to have a long-term effect and deal uh, with energy and environment and climate at the same time. So um, when we now look at the figures, uh, then what is apparent is that at European level, uh, to be a bit closer to home here, at European level, the allocation uh, to railway investments is only 1.8% of all so-called green investments in the total package. Now, the percentage of green investments is very difficult to calculate. It's a question of definition. Um, but we can say that overall, an average, including Japan, including the United States, in these national programs, the green recovery element is between 10 and 15 percent. And this 1.8 percent I'm referring to for the European Union, for Europe actually, is 1.8 percent of these 15 percent. Um, and if we break that down uh, one step further to a national budget like Germany, then there's 1.6 percent of the 80 billion euro um, uh, double uh, economic recovery program, uh, program one and two together, uh, it's 1.6% for rail only, which is a total amount of 1.8 billion euros out of those 80 billion euros. Um, and when we look at what is being allocated to the road transportation sector, then this is between 50 to 100 percent higher than the allocation to uh, uh, rail, uh, not counting uh, in the road allocation section the scrappage incentives for uh, cars. They are a separate pot and are not allocated in this um, program and these percentages. So the point uh, I want to make, and you can read these figures, actually find them in a recent study of the HSBC Bank, which is a very thoughtful and in-depth study, which has been picking up all these figures at national budgets and put them through the mincing machine. Uh, if we look at all this together, it is obvious <clears throat> that either the railway family, the railway industry, hasn't done a good job in lobbying for higher amounts. And this is uh, something you may want to answer to later in the discussion. Or it is an underestimation of the environmental leverage railways have uh, in terms of accelerating the reduction of CO2. Uh, or it's both. Uh, now, just to keep in mind figures uh, you may be aware of, but they have to be repeated again and again, and in particular repeated in public. A transport of 100 tons in goods from Basel, Switzerland, to Rotterdam, Netherlands, by train, causes 87% less CO2 emissions than the transport of the same amount on road. And when you compare it with inland waterways, the railway transportation has still 42% less CO2 emissions than uh, the inland waterway transport. And still, there is much more space for further improvement of these figures. Deutsche Bahn, for instance, for instance has managed to reduce its relative energy consumption in the freight sector by 40% since 1990. Now, this is only the beginning. If railways and manufacturers would be more aggressive and would cooperate better than they have so far, the green technologies, and you from UNIFE probably will make this point, uh, can be applied on a much broader scale. So the advantage, which is already there on lower CO2 emissions, can be further improved and increased. And this is not an opportunity, it is a necessity, because as a former member of the automotive uh, industry at BMW and at Toyota recently, I can only tell you that the technology threat from the automotive industry will make railways run much faster in the future, and you're well advised to accelerate your development and application of modern technologies in that industry. Nevertheless, public investment in infrastructure has been clearly favoring road instead of rail transport. And since 1970, 
the length of rail infrastructure in Europe has declined, while the length of motorways, as most of you know, has more than tripled. The market share of rail freight transport in Europe is still declining, now at 16.8% of all ton kilometers, despite of its clear environmental and cost advantages. It's a shame that this is happening, uh, keeping in mind that this is moving things in the wrong direction from an environmental point of view. There are, however, a few examples where the situation is different. And before Mr. Leuenberger arrives, I probably anticipate what he's going to say. Uh, the market share of rail freight transport in Switzerland is 40% as compared to the 16.8% uh, in Europe, outside Switzerland which is twice as much or more than twice as much as in the rest of Europe. Yeah, the Swiss in this respect can say, yes, we can. However, a clear political will is necessary to shift the current paradigm from road to rail transport in the rest of Europe. Switzerland is a good example for this political determination, this yes, we can in green transport and mass transport policy. And let me add to close, the Swiss road toll is currently about four times higher than in Germany and three times higher than in Austria and twice as high as in the Czech Republic. This toll generates the funds that are needed to invest in modern rail infrastructure and tunnels. Currently, two-thirds of the north-south transalpine freight, freight transits through Switzerland is handled on rail. In Austria, with similar mountains, with less rigid rail transport policy, the relation is the opposite. Two-thirds on the road and one-third on the rail, with the corresponding external costs in terms of pollution, noise, and CO2 emissions. So the opportunities are there. This is the time to make use of these opportunities under the global green recovery programs. We must not use this great opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ewald von Körber. Mr. Klausecker, it's your turn uh, about uh, losing or missing the chance, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Michael Klausecker, and I'm representing UNIFE, the European Rail Industry Association. So we are the manufacturers of railway material. Um, how could rail contribute to resolve both the economic and the environmental crisis we are in? That was the question that was put to me, and I'd like to, to make two points um, on this, uh, to this debate. Number one, we are deeply convinced that rail investments contribute to economic growth, and uh, I can prove this claim um, with the example of Spain. Spain has invested massively over the last 15 years in rail infrastructure, um, and the investment in, in particular in high-speed rail infrastructure in Spain has contributed by 2.5 percent points to the economic growth of the country over that period of time. There are three sets of effects, a short-term short investment shock effect, of course, there is a, the economic benefit of an improved infrastructure, and there is a certain efficiency effect. The good thing is it's a long-term effect to the economic growth uh, that is uh, followed by rail infrastructure investment. And once such new infrastructure is in the place and once the new high-speed lines are in operation, they are followed by an increased demand. And I'd like to share some examples with you. If you look at the Paris-London line, for example, the train today has a market share of above 70%. Brussels-London, more than 70% of the passengers go with the train. Madrid-Sevilla, market share of the train, above 80%. And uh, the latest example, Madrid-Barcelona, the line has been opened only a year ago. The train by today has a market share of 53%. Now, the, envi the environmental benefits of such uh, investments are obvious. Any passenger, and every single passenger, in fact, that shifts mode from the plane to the train reduces his carbon footprint by 90%. 90%, that's a lot. Now, how could, how could policymakers contribute to, to achieve such economic and environmental effects? 
Of course, they have to help to put the investments in the place, no question. But a second point I'd like to stress here is the question of leveling the playing field. And very obviously, I'd like to share an example for you, with you. Very obviously, VAT is a point where we have to change something. The passenger that takes the plane to go from Brussels to London today has to pay a VAT on his ticket of 21% the same passenger that uses the train to go from Brussels to London, um, excuse me, the passenger that takes the plane pays no VAT at all, the same passenger that goes from Brussels to London has to pay 21% VAT on his ticket. And obviously, 21% is a huge advantage for the plane and a huge disadvantage for the train. For the train, that would reduce the carbon footprint of the passenger by 90%. So, we need help of policymakers to get things right and to improve the competitiveness of rail, um, even though the, the economic and environmental benefits are obviously yet there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Klaudecker. Um, okay, Mr. Leonberger, uh, we were waiting for you. Good, you arrived here, and real the point, and you got the chance now. We have to, could already. Uh, President, everyone has on the panelists has presented his own program. So now you got the chance to de to deliver your speech, which we were waiting for earlier. And after that, Mr. Bertak is going to finish up, and then we start the discussion. So the floor is now yours for your uh, announced speech of 20 minutes, if I remember well. Herzlichen Dank, Herr Präsident. Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich möchte mich sehr Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course, I want to first of all apologize for um, arriving late to this workshop. I must emphasize it has not been a German train that has been delayed. Rather, it's been me who got trapped up in the claws of a federal parliament committee who has kept me back. I've never seen such a situation before. This has been an experience I don't want to really speak disrespectfully. We were talking about uh, nuclear waste removal, and you can believe me that really uh, the mood was very heated. It was a very heated debate, so I certainly deplore not being able to respond or react to previous contributions. If I understood you correctly, May I address you from the Swiss Frog's perspective, so to say, explaining to you which has been the transport policy that we've been uh, operating so far and how we interpret it. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. So allow me to proceed. R the railways is actually national companies. This is their strength, but it is also a weakness inherent in the railway systems. As I talk about the Swiss transport uh, policy, which uh, primarily is a railways uh, associated policy, then it is very important to explain that the national identity that has been generated by the Swiss railway system, because the railways system has a very long standing tradition. Uh, high school students and citizens have always taken pride in the achievements of the engineering feats associated with building the transalpine uh, railways, but also the outer appearance with its labeling in three languages, its punctuality, which is uh, an image that has always been kept up and cultivated that the Swiss railways is always punctual and people are deeply convinced and are convinced that it has to be punctual, too. So these are identity-linked features which are deliberately being uh, fomented and divulged as natu national uh, features. And any major uh, or large-scale project in Switzerland, would, which has to be voted on with plebiscites, actually uh, has shown that the railway system has always enjoyed high support levels. And, and the real crisis, I mean, if we're talking about the crisis that 
throughout the times, uh, support f for the railways, especially high in the southern uh, canton of uh, Tessin, because it guarantees jobs. And in the free market economy, uh, uh, this is something that we always would be interested in finding all about it out. And the plebiscites have all been successful in favor of uh, public transport systems. So the project as such uh, has been operating two uh, basic alpine tunnels. One has been inaugurated. The Gotthard Tunnel will be opened uh, shortly. Uh, investment has amounted to 20 billion francs, and a plebiscite was uh, resorted to uh, in order to approve the project. The uh, toll has to be uh, is levied uh, amongst other reasons in order to be able to fund building uh, and expanding the railway system. All, this was subjected to plebiscite too, and it was also approved. The rationale used was uh, that transparency and truth in the declaration of cost involved in comparison with uh, a road haulage that it, uh, by, by, by truck uh, was very decisive, and also the shift as such. The, 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 the shift of goods road haulage to uh, freight haulage uh, on uh, the railways has been very uh, convincing and uh, played a major role in the Swiss plebiscites. And overall funding of this uh, uh, transalpine uh, railways uh, system was also finally approved by the uh, parliament. Various sources were resorted to for the funds, this, which was then merged into one single fund from which uh, the uh, railway's infrastructure was then built. This is a very important innovation in our policies because previously funding the infrastructure had always uh, been something that depended on the results of budget debates in the parliament. So everybody was trembling from Christmas onwards when parliamentary debates were underway as to always in, in in the context of the respective political preferences of the time. So one had to tremble and fear whether the project would be fully funded or not. So infrastructure was always subject to everyday policies, but this has been done away with, and it is now really a matter that is approved by the plebiscite. So there, there will be no further such very rough fluctuations. And I'm convinced, and I've discussed this yesterday in Geneva with the German delegates, that is, uh, the uh, links and connections in the south of Germany to the north of Baal, whether these connections are guaranteed or not. Well, we have concluded a state treaty which has been ratified, but for various reasons, uh, I've heard rumors that these had been postponed, now, and, but that now, in the light of the necessary stimulus packages, that again priority had been uh, allocated to these issues. So our solution, I think, is a long-term solution, which is very favorable. And in the beginning, I had mentioned that the railways are, are always a national company and uh, they guarantee the identity and the cohesion. At the same time, however, in the times of globalization and in times of German uh, European unity, this is also a great weakness. We were in Genoa, the Netherlands, Germany, the Switzer uh, Switzerland and Italy and talked about the Rotterdam-Genoa corridor. We made great progress. Red tape at the border crossings, that's a big obstacle. Free access, that's always the slogan, but free access is not a reality yet. I've seen it myself. I've seen what it means in Italy, for example, to ensure that trains 
can actually cross the border going from Italy via Switzerland to Germany, for example. The electronic security system, ETCS, is not really working properly at a pan-European level yet. That requires a lot of investment. Another issue that's being discussed here today is this. Can the market regulate the future of the railways or are authorities, are the governments supposed to step in in times of crisis? Just one comment on that. I'm convinced that the thrust for mobility is very deeply entrenched in every single human being and a government cannot regulate this thrust, this desire for mobility. The automotive industry, of course, is shaping this desire for mobility. And so the globalization of nation states has not been in step with what happened uh, in that field, in the field of uh, the automotive industry. In some states, the automotive industry plays a huge economic role. In other states, such as Switzerland, it doesn't. And so there are rules and agreements on the technological barriers to trade that may mean that we also have to accept all those automobiles, all those cars. And so we are being pressured to, pre to build the necessary infrastructure to use them. However, if we want to use the current crisis in order to have a sustainable, environmentally friendly political framework for the railways, then we need certain rules presented by the government for mobility. This, the governments have to make sure that traffic is shifted to the railways, and of course the railways have to be environmentally friendly, have to fulfill certain environmental standards in terms of noise, pollution, for example, because there are people living along the railway lines as well. Another aspect is CO2 emissions. So far, we've been trying to, to keep down CO2 emissions in the transport field. It's a law in Switzerland, however, we have not succeeded. On the contrary, CO2 emissions in transport have risen because car use has risen. Despite our law, there was nothing we could do about it. There's a new law now, or a new bill, that has been presented to Parliament recently. And in this bill, CO2 emissions are seen as emissions um, covering the whole country. It's a blanket figure, and particular figures for transport can only be fixed if the overall limits that are being discussed for Copenhagen, 20 or 30 percent, cannot be reached. So much in terms of background information regarding what we've been able to do and where the challenges lie. Thank you very much, uh, especially to sharing is the way to paradise. Funds independent from actual policies, direct investments into infrastructure or railways. That is something people would like to hear around uh, the table and uh, I think in the audience as well. But we're going to come to that later. Mr. Clark. Thank you very much. Yes, that's something we would like to hear. Funds which are independent of policy influences and to be spent by infrastructure managers for the rail industry. Um, but, Mr. Chairman, that's, we're not in heaven yet. Um, Long way to paradise. Yes. Um, well, we, uh, uh, as Europe, uh, uh, Europe's independent rail infrastructure managers, we fully support the notion that investing in rail support in rail can support economy, uh, uh, the recovery of the economy and helping to reduce the transport sector CO2 footprint. But um, we have to invest in the rail infrastructure industry. Um, and we have to invest uh, 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 urgently because, as you, Mr. Minister, already said, when you look at the figures, um, it is necessary 
because transport alone is responsible in the EU for 27% of CO2 emissions, of which over 70% of this 27% uh, uh, is generated by the road transport. And unlike other sectors, transport emissions continue growing because we can't control mobility. So they continue growing and are proving a serious obstacle for the EU to meet the target of a 20% cut in 2020. So although rail is green, as we all say, and has a substantial upper hand on other means of transportation. We should aim in, impro on, on, in, in improving our performance. As infrastructure managers in Europe, we are committed to, making, to make these investments work. And given the energy efficiency, the low environmental footprint, the best uh, uh, um, contribution the rail sector can make to the environment is to increase its share of the transport market. One example I will give you is that the Harbour Authority in Rotterdam has uh, uh, um, put into the contracts in the new area of the, of the Rotterdam Harbour, Mass Vlakte 2, a obligation that for every new entrance in the harbour, 20% of the uh, uh, transport has to be dealt with by trade. But we have to invest, and infrastructure managers are investing in many innovative services to improve the connections between modes. I will give you a few examples. In Belgium, for example, Infrabel is investing 800 million euros to reduce journey, time, journey times and increase capacity in the port of Antwerp. In Sweden, Baanwerket is cooperating with rail and terminal operators to to develop fast freight shuttle connections between Göteborg and the inland terminals, reducing costs on the one side and pollution, uh, and pollution and improving services to the customers. In the Netherlands, we, ProRail, we have challenged our professional counterparts to come up with innovative solutions to a question we have raised, how can the Kyoto uh, uh, ob objectives be reached on the route between two cities in the Netherlands. And we have got many reactions to this contest, and they have provided us with truly innovative and also highly workable solutions. Extra spending in rail infrastructure is happening in the countries with the most ambitious economic recovery plans. France, for example, has embarked on the construction of four new high speed lines, high speed lines, while at the same time to ensure that these projects are truly compliant with the principles of sustainable development, Réseau Ferré de France has therefore decided to produce a complete carbon footprint for the eastern branch of its Rhine Rhone high speed line. Germany is implementing the ERTMS signaling system on freight corridors. In the UK, there are new high-speed rail projects and electrification of the busiest lines. In the Netherlands, we, ProRail, have, together with the Ministry of Transport, launched a 140 million euro acceleration package in the investments in the railway sector. These are not only short-term investments, but they're also long-term investments, making it possible to accelerate uh, 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 not, only, uh, uh, not only to create jobs for the short-term, but also to have investment uh, 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 policy for the long-term. We shouldn't forget that capacity on the existing lines would also be freed up for freight transport. Improved infrastructure quality would, in addition, reinforce the attractiveness as well as the economy on and the job market of the regions served by the rail. However, investment must be structured properly to achieve the maximum benefit. It goes without saying that the European institutions have an important role to play in triggering this positive chain reaction. 
In particular, financial instruments should be tailor-made for the railway sector. Private-public partnership is necessary and they should be linked to environmental uh, performance as well as to the implementation of the EU legislation. Mr. Chairman, returning to the original question, if done properly, increased investment in rail will both help to overcome the financial crisis while reducing the climate impact of transport. Investment in specific green projects will further reduce rail's environmental impact by creating additional capacity. Investment will ensure rail is ready to meet the increased demand for transport when the economy begins to grow again. So, the climate is right for rail. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, especially for the last uh, uh, statement that the climate is right for rail. Uh, but unfortunately, as it, we look around, except for our neighbours in the south in Switzerland, uh, uh, politics don't see it that way, because if the hour is now, well, it's only 1.6%, as uh, Ebert von Körber was saying, which is going to be uh, directed into that beautiful, beautiful future project out of the 80 billion new money to in, for incentive. So what can be done about it? Where uh, could the pressure come from to uh, divert of the money existing, even if it's... Uh, well, that uh, uh, created money, artificially created money, to uh, direct it into this field. Um, Mr. Cardozo, do you think your government uh, could be convinced to direct differently? I think so. Um, and the examples are the investment in rolling stock. Uh, as I told you, we asked for um, 102 trains. We are constructing uh, 400 wagons at this moment. Um, we received 25 locals, uh, electrical locals for freight. Um, and the investment in terms of infrastructure is going on. It's going on in the conventional network and also um, I think this week uh, the government will receive the first proposal for the new high-speed link from Lisbon to Madrid. Uh, something like 100 kilometers, something like that. So, the investment uh, uh, is in, 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 in the table. Uh, we have also, uh, in CP, uh, the activity of maintenance of trains. And I think this is also an opportunity to, to increase employment. Because when we ask for new trains, we consider in the, in the BIDA, in the tender documents, that one part of the, 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 the proposal uh, has to be done uh, in Portugal. So we increase employment, we, we increase our engineering uh, uh, p personnel, and we ensure that in the future maintenance may be done with our experts and we are uh, laborers. So this, this is another way with the investment in, in rolling stock to promote future uh, employment and to ensure that uh, our economy will be linked to, uh, as, as I told in the beginning, to um, uh, a healthy, healthy uh, system. Of, of doing the, the, the job. I think we, we I heard you uh, saying that uh, perhaps we have not done the, the job as we uh, needed to do it. Uh, but I think the, the forces are un, unbalanced completely because the, the dimension of the road sector is uh, completely different uh, uh, from ours. Um, and it is natural. But I think we, we can, we can uh, combat that uh, unbalanced uh, relation with information, more information, communication with people, um, telling what is happening in the future if things continue like this. So uh, it's a question of informing people, telling them what will be their future. So we need to communicate, communicate and communicate. That's the, the, the only way to change things, I think.
May I ask you one question? Could, could you give us some concrete figures of the money provided for over recovery? What sort of percentage is going to be directed into that field? Would you give you some figures about, I mean, trains and, and, and systems and wagons? You got figures? You could say this 10% or whatever? The, 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 um, the, the amount. Na national? Yes. National. national. No. Portugal. No, Portugal. Uh, in the demand? No, no. no. You were talking about, we oh, bought yes. this, the government just decided this and that. Could you give us an overall uh, figure, all that, the percentage of, the percentage of what of the, new, the money provided for economic recovery in Portugal is directed into these, for these items? I don't have it. No, thank you. Yeah, we have, uh, we have done a survey of European governments and their programs on, uh, on spending um, to, for economic recovery and to which extent they would uh, invest in rail. And what we've seen is that in, in Eastern Europe we, we don't find any particular, <coughs> any particular pro programs uh, to invest in rail to, to, for economic recovery. In, in Western Europe it's a bit different. Um, we have uh, two, three countries that are already spending large amounts for rail infrastructure, that's the UK, that's Spain, and that is also France. And the three of them, uh, well, UK and Spain have maintained their very ambitious programs. The UK is spending something like 9 billion euros this year in rail infrastructure and also over the next years. Um, and France has accelerated its, uh, its spending uh, for rail infrastructure with the projected uh, new high-speed lines. In Germany, there is indeed an additional uh, package for investing in uh, transport infrastructure. So the investment is increased from around 10 to 11 billion euros this year. And out of the one additional billion euro, uh, there will be 250 million spent for ERTMS, so for a new advanced signaling system. And there will also be a few hundred million spent for the modernization of railway stations. Um, so, at least I would say um, it's, it's already good that those countries that are very ambitious with investing in rail, the UK, Spain, France, maintain their programs, even though it's more difficult to, to finance them in this uh, situation, but apparently they have recognized the big importance of such investments. And, uh, and Germany, again, has, uh, has even increased its spending. However, um, co if we consider the amount of money being spent additionally for rail infrastructure in China. Um, the spendings here in Europe are really marginal. Yeah. China, in fact, today is the country that is uh, spending the largest amounts for, its, uh, for, the, for the improvement and modernization and even building up of its uh, transport infrastructure, in particular its rail infrastructure, and it has even, even uh, tremendously increased its spending now in this particular difficult period. Thank you. Mukherjee, you want to answer to that? Yeah, I just would like to clarify um, the figures uh, you're referring to, Mr. Glasecker, are the, the normal, ordinary railway budgets uh, as they are running year by year. What I have been referring to are the new economic stimulation programs for green recovery to overcome the world crisis. Uh, where uh, the figure for Germany is 80 billion euros, 80 billion euros. And that was the figure I related to and said it's only 1.6% of that amount which goes into railways, and roughly double of that, actually more, including the scrapping um, uh, allowance uh, for car owners, uh, goes into uh, automotive uh, and, and roads. And that is not the right proportion to overcome the risks of climate change. And somebody has made this point uh, in the various countries to get a higher share to combine economic stimulation with green recovery. Even then, uh, even uh, if those methods take a longer time and are not just automatically or that's in the next three or six months working. I mean, this is the argument from the political side saying wonderful investment in the long but that doesn't help us today to get the unemployment rate uh, or keep it under five, four million. That is the, the politi political answer. Yeah, and that's exactly wrong uh, because this is done to win the next elections and not to get our countries all right. I mean, the whole scrapping uh, allowance for cars pulls forward certain sales which later are not taking place. Once this whole program is over, 
will have a steep decline of car sales probably in 2010. So economically, you have done a bit before the elections, but not something which is sustainable. Ben Clark, please. Is there, there, are, there are, I would like also to refer to what Mr. Leuwenberg said, but first the figures, uh, because I, I, we shouldn't impress each other on, on figures only. Um, as an infrastructure manager, I always think afterwards, is there a contractor who can spend all the money uh, uh, and build the railways between, in, in the, the area we want, to we want to have them build? Um, in the Netherlands, we did two things. Um, we have an acceleration program for the recovery of the uh, economical crisis to help the contractors uh, 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 keep their people at work, which is, Netherlands is a small country, so it's a relatively small amount of money. It's one, what I said, 140 million euros for 2009, 2010, and 2011. But the Netherlands government said we would like to have a increase on uh, uh, the rail network with, for passengers f if, until 2020 by 50%. And they spent in those years uh, 4.5 billion euros to increase the capacity of the network. For the Netherlands, that means not only uh, uh, um, building new uh, um, 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 railways because, you know, we, have, we are only in a small country, but look at the possibilities to increase the, exist, the usage of the existing, system, uh, uh, existing railway system. That means um, small infrastructure uh, enlargement, but uh, investing in uh, um, uh, new servicing systems, investing in uh, uh, our stations, uh, etc., etc. And we are going to spend 4.5 billion, especially to compete with other transportation modes. And of course, you saw that yesterday when you signed the, a new agreement, when you look at the Rotterdam uh, uh, Genera uh, um, uh, corridor, you see how difficult it is to have a cross-border uh, uh, corridor which works on the same, uh, um, on the same uh, uh, system. Um, and that is our weakness. We are based in, uh, on a national organ. We are national organized. That's where we come from. I mean, the railway system was a strategic uh, uh, element in our defense systems. So we have, we have to overcome that. And it's an illusion that we can overcome that in five, 10 or 15 years. We are happy when we have on the Rotterdam Genera corridor in 2015 the same ERTMS system for all, for all the, the, the four countries and at last a train can run smoothly from Rotterdam to Genera. It, will take, it, it takes us in all those years, more than 10 years, to resolve all the existing problems we have between our countries. And we, we need to spend a lot of money to overcome those differences. But do you see any chance that uh, uh, um, Holland is going to follow the Swiss example, taking Maut, uh, the toll, and put him in an extra fund and then make it more or less neutral from political influence? And uh, well, I mean, this is, looks like, I said that before, it looks like paradise. You divert it from there and then political mood of today or politicians regaining their power or defending their seats will not infringe on these funds. They are almost sacrosanct because, and invested into this field. Could Holland ever consider this sort of policy? I don't think, I, d I don't think that's necessary. Um, we already have a fund of 4.5 billion and uh, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, it's, quite a, uh, it's quite a job to get it spent. Um, because I can't find the contractors uh, 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 who, who can uh, do all the jobs we have to do at, at, at the railway network in the Netherlands at this moment. But there's another s s a thing to discuss. Um, the, it's, it's also in the OECD report. That's the, the charge that is paid by the users of the railway system. We spend in the Netherlands 1.3 billion euros uh, uh, on the exploitation of the network, and the users of the system only pay, let's say, 20% of it, which is 
rather strange uh, uh, when you look when you compare it with the with the, with the other modes of transport. Um, so a fund uh, uh, independent of political influence is necessary um, in those cases. The re the means are. Um, during every cabinet period of a cabinet are changing. Um, so what we are in need of is the, the possibility of, of having multi-annual multi contracts so that we are sure of the, uh, let's say, the contractual relationship we have with the government uh, uh, and the contractual relationship we have with our customers. Um, and in some ways a fund can help, but I'm not sure if, if that's the solution for all of our problems. Thank you. I would like to remind us of uh, a discussion which is now 20 years old. It's the Trans-European Network uh, discussion and strategy which Jacques Delors created in the late 80s. And uh, there are areas where we have made great progress on highways and there are areas where we have not made great progress. On railways we have the problems you just referred to and on high voltage grids, we don't have enough couplings. There is an institutional resistance against this. And I think the railway family has to make this point in public, that this is moving too slowly. We are since 20 years trying to move forward, and Europe is not progressing on the networks, the trans-European networks, properly ever since Jacques Delors is not anymore in Brussels. It has slowed down. National interests and vested industrial interests have slowed it down. And that's a shame for European competitiveness. And we could do much better. Does anyone want to answer that? An unanswered question by Jacques Delors since 20 years? No. Oh. Well, that's the moment now. I said, well, uh, let's have the chance to, or let the public have the chance to participate. Well, over there, well, I think. Yes, from France. But there's someone from uh, Lord Berkeley. Hello, Tony. It's, it's Tony Berkeley here. Um, I'm president of the European Rail Freight Association, which is the association of private op rail freight operators in Europe. And this year we have the House of Rail, which includes customers and wagon operators and um, leasing companies and things like that. I thought we've had a, a really interesting discussion. And Bert Clerk, I think, hit the nail on the head when he said we must increase our market share. Mr. von Kerben said um, the share is declining, and he's quite right, because we don't have fair competition between the public sector freight operators and the private sector ones at the moment. I agree we've got to sort out the infrastructure. It's very important, and we, uh, all the problems of frontiers, but there is no fair competition. Just to give one or two examples, um, the... Need, th th there needs to be no state aids for the freight operators because how can private ones compete with public ones if they're getting state aids? And at the moment there's a big demand for state aids because some of the public companies um, are going bust or they're threatening to go bust. Our solution is to sell the companies off to the private sector. Then you're going to have fair competition because at the moment the... You, 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 can't, <clears throat> you can't get across frontiers, you have, don't have fair regulation, and I can't understand why the member states and many of the incumbent railways are opposing opening up the market to the private sector, which would enable fair competition. And I think Mr. Leuenberger hit the nail on the head. He's, in Switzerland, you have it to a large extent, but in the rest of Europe, in many member states, it's very, very difficult. And if we get competition, then we'll get growth in the rail freight sector. Okay, I, uh, Mr. Gattel. I would like to say something about that. <clears throat> I'm an incumbent. I'm an uh, own state company. And I'm not afraid of competence. Uh, and I want it in a fair condition also. Um, fair condition that includes uh, privates that don't have the domain of ports that in pitches are uh, public operators to go there. Um, private operators which has the same problems that we have, a past that we can change with unions, with uh, 
traditional achievements that workers have and the, the difficulties that uh, those kind of companies have. Uh, I would like to have uh, the same conditions as private to operate in fair competition with them, but I can't because I have to ensure the employment of too many people that I don't need. I have to accomplish uh, some needs that you, you don't have, but I have to do it. So uh, it's a both side uh, Problem, problems that we have, uh, each one competing with their problems, but with fairness. For my side, always with fairness. But if we conclude what you said then, then you said you are on an, an equal playing field because you have to care for the workforce for social reasons more than a private employer has to. Therefore, the state has, uh, well, uh, better conditions, say the other one, to approach uh, uh, public orders. So, uh, uh, social, uh, let's say, uh, social feelings uh, put you on the same playing field. Is that your answer? It's quite so. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Kladek, yes. Obviously, liberalization plays an important role and contributes to growth in rail freight transport. And the good thing about this is it, it needs support from policymakers, from national policymakers, um, but it goes at no cost. So other than the decision to, to uh, take away VAT from passenger tickets, this one costs nothing. But it needs to be put into place, no question. There is a nice statistics um, that is published every other year. It's called the Liberalisierungsindex, which compares the degree of, liber of railway liberalization in European countries. And uh, we have compared um, this ranking in liberalization with the growth in rail freight transport over the last 10 years. And what you see is very obviously very striking that the top countries in liberalization, the UK, the Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, have, have encountered above 50% growth in rail freight transport over the last 10 years. Now, if you go to the bottom of the ranking and you see countries like France, Spain, and some others, you will find that freight rail freight transport has not grown at all in these countries. So yes, liberalization is very important and I'd like to support the argument of Tony Berkeley. That point. Thank you very yeah, much. I, well, Mr. Ludwig, it's, you need a microphone, it's behind you. Okay, um, what I would like to say, I think we, we all agree and we have seen in the last 10 years that liberalization market opening is, in mathematics you would say, a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. Because in, in the railways are a system and you can have liberalized everything if you have no tracks to run on, then you don't get very far. So that is, is a very simple thing. And if you see the motorway network in Europe since 1970 has tripled in Europe. The railway network is the same as about 100 years ago. So I think it is pretty clear you, that infrastructure is what you need in addition, I think, to, to market opening liberalization. And I think the key problem, that is the difference with Switzerland is, that the pricing system is the key difference between Switzerland on the one side and the rest of Europe on the other side. The Swiss system allows the so-called internalization of external costs. What there you have to pay, have a, running a truck on the motorway, is they have to pay for all the costs, including damage to the environment, climate change, and so on. This is about, I think, 49 or 50 cents per vehicle kilometer. In Germany, it's about 18 cents per vehicle kilometer. And we have a European law, and that is indeed, in my view, still the scandal, if you want. We have a European directive saying that the internalization of external costs, that means the damage to environment, climate change, noise, is not allowed in Europe to take, be taken into account in the pricing, you know, the trucks, the road freight transport pays, I think. And that is the pr problem. We have a pricing system in Europe which is artificially low. And the European Commission has the responsibility and the European institutions together because they have a law which says even if a country like Germany, the Netherlands, ever, would like to do that, that means to internalize the costs, the European Commission would come and say, you are not allowed to do that. And this is a real scandal. That means we have a pricing system in the transport sector which does not reflect the real costs. 
And as everybody, know, every economist, and I think everybody knows, if you have a pricing system which does not reflect the cost, people think that this service is cheap and the demand will increase. And the, re the revenues you have, I think, from what they pay is not sufficient, I think, to follow by constructing investors. So the whole system is not really balanced. And just to contribute a recent experience, the Commission has made recently a proposal, a first step, I think, to allow member states to internalize external costs if they wish to do so, only in a limited extent, but nevertheless. And this project is stuck in the Council. Member states don't want, I think, to do that. And if you talk to ministers or ministries, and I've done that in the last month several times, the answer you get is the following. The arguments you are, we are putting forward and everybody are all correct. And in principle, we are ready, but not now. And that means, of course, the current structure is, has a tremendous political weight. You know, the, the whole road structure covering 70%, I think, today, if you tell them that all this is becoming uh, more expensive, then you can imagine what is going to happen. And the, the real challenge and difficulty for the politicians is, I think, to do something which is not in line, I think, with the interest, I think, of the transport structure, the road structure, which has been established over the last 50 years in Europe. And now to bring about structural change is, of course, extremely different. Difficult, And the Swiss, I think, they have shown that economies don't break down. I think if you actually do it, you know, that is what we have learned. But in the rest of Europe, uh, it is not happening. And the, you, I think the first green paper of the European Commission saying this has to be done goes back to 1995. Now we are in the year 2009, uh, which is 14 years later, and it is not yet reality. And a wrong pricing system, of course, is steering the whole system in a wrong way. And that is, I think, the core part, I think, of the problem. If we don't change that, I don't think that we can change also, I think, the behavior of the whole system and bring about structural change. Don't forget, that is my last remark. The White Paper of 2001, the objective of the White Paper 2001 was, I think, to stabilize market shares and particularly for freight to reach 35%. And now, 10 years later, we see that all the objectives set in that white paper, that we will fail to achieve that, by far. And I don't see for the moment a radical change in policy to make, to make that the objectives, which were set already 10 years ago, will actually be achieved. So in principle, everybody knows what we have to do. But what is the reality is that I think politics nowadays in Europe doesn't find the way I think, to take the necessary decisions, which when you talk to them privately, everybody says, that's what we have to do. But it simply doesn't happen. Thank you, Mr. Ludwig. There are many battlefields, not only national election campaigns or uh, uh, regaining power, it's Europe as well as a battlefield. But uh, we didn't want to exclude all the others. Are there more? Uh, yes, please, Hello. lady over there. Could you please... Uh, uh, give your name and, and, and what you present. Okay. Allô, vous m'entendez Oui, euh, ministère de l'écologie en France. Alors tout d'abord, je voulais euh, remercier et vous féliciter, monsieur Lohenberger. I would like to... Je crois que c'est vraiment ça le développement durable, donc on a été tous très heureux. De... I don't get it. Que son intervention a été faite dans sa langue maternelle, exemple... We are very happy that uh, you mentioned those examples, Mr. Lohenberger. There are examples that we can give ourselves along those lines. We don't really have much support for infrastructure in the railway sector, not uh, like in other countries that have been mentioned here. And in the environmental field, there have been incentives also regarding CO2 emissions. Would you mind speaking a bit more slowly, says the chairman, because we've got interpretation. Well, we should not only talk about what could be done for the railways. There is necessary investment. Specific examples were mentioned. But we also have to say that there are huge disadvantages for the other means of transport and the other modes. The use of energy is not the only argument. Other arguments should be used as well. 
We should also say that other options are not always used because they require a lot of energy. We could say that using road haulage might ship goods from door to door, but requires a lot of energy. The railways have a lot of things um, going for it. These things should be mentioned. It's important to talk about these as well. Yeah. Nicht wahr? Wir müssen auch aufpassen, die Verlagerungsfrage nicht zu einem ideologischen Krieg. We must make sure to not to convert a shifting uh, road haulage to raid haulage uh, as an ideological issue. That's the danger. We've always held also in our negotiations with the European Union uh, when it was about the bilateral uh, land transport uh, agreement that we also shift back to the road. Because if you see what is uh, happening in northern Italy, you have uh, motorways where you have two lanes that are congested by trucks, whereas uh, motorways actually well, I have been turned into something of a, uh, a, a warehouse uh, of uh, congesting uh, trucks that wait to go on, and all these beautiful Alfa Romeos and other uh, trendy cars are waiting in a stop-and-go action and can't get hit. And this is something you've got to tell the Italians. You're also doing it for your private uh, uh, transportation. It may sound a bit demagogical, however, a short time ago, I was in Hamburg. For a Swiss, it's always a huge experience to be directly by the seaside. However, to see a vessel with more than 10,000 containers, there are eight such vessels that are transporting uh, goods between Asia and Europe, traveling back and forth. Just imagine 10,000 containers. If you distribute them on trucks, that would be amounting to a length of 100 kilometers. That is, the route between Bern and Zurich would be completely clogged up by this large queue of trucks. And the mobility and the tracking, uh, taking these goods from any point in the world to another one, means that it, roads are simply hopelessly overburdened. Even if we add up all the countries, he can, could not or never make available such lengths of road. Uh, this is why, for instance, aside from the environmental pr problem in terms of uh, space planning and logistically, it is compulsory to do so. And the environmental issue enters here, too. So actually, in, in, in detailed distribution, trucks do make sense, of course. That's quite clear. In our transit transport in Switzerland, uh, the percentage of rail transport is about two-thirds, up to two-fourths is transported by rail, and uh, the remainder is transported on the road. But actually, if you break it down, uh, trucks are still necessary. You cannot build tracks uh, in each one family uh, residential house. Even though you have demands uh, that are sent by children, could I kindly provide a railway connection to their family home? But that only shows and illustrates how identified the Swiss feel with their railway Thank system. Thank you very much for such an oh, emotional and uh, likely answer to that. But we still got some time. Yes, straight on. Someone is going to hand you a microphone. Yeah, hopefully there on your left-hand side, the yellow one. Heiner Rogge, I'm the Secretary General of the European Shippers Organization, Plegard. And I'd like to comment on the uh, presentation by Mr. Ludwig and also on what Mr. Leuenberger told us. We, the uh, haulers, would be very pleased with structures that would allow us to use the railway system more than is possible until today. We're founding members of the German intermodal uh, transport 
uh, uh, confederation. This only illustrates that we also invest in alternative transport modes and we need uh, in the navigation, which is mainly uh, Rhineland-based uh, uh, transport companies. But Mr. Ludwig, I think I can dare and hold that uh, even if external costs incurred on road transport and on rail transport and uh, combination will not solve the problem at all. And I hear from Mr. Kirk that in the Netherlands, the customer uh, actually pays only 20% of uh, infrastructure costs. We know from many European countries that infrastructure costs on the railway transport are not paid for by the customer. That is, if this principle were applied everywhere, I would like to see what the result would be in terms of um, the market economy uh, associated principles. But many European states, Mr. Ludwig, you, you said that in the beginning, actually we should be well positioned in long haul in international operations without having the problems at the borders that we have today. Is there really a convincing business model available right now? Many European states are not very interested in goods transport. Two days ago, I read in the German press and the Handelsblatt, I read an interview with Mr. Pepi from SNCF where he questions whether the individual uh, wagon based, uh, wagon based uh, transport is really worth price because their heavy loss is 40% of uh, transport activities uh, really causes 70% of overall losses. This happens in Italy, too. So a number of European countries can be cited where transport activities are really extremely unprofitable, for instance. So one asks oneself, will we uh, continue with individual uh, transport uh, cars? It's 40% of transport activities. If we speak of premium, transport activities because we are the confederation of intermodal activities. We observe that as far as the quality of cooperation and transport is unchanged, uh, has been remained unchanged in the past 15 years. If we don't overcome this problem, I dare and doubt that what you aspire to, that to uh, produce this increasing shift to rail transport, whether we can really achieve our goal because it will be sustainable only if uh, the business model provides uh, for uh, sustainable uh, profits uh, for users and uh, and operators alike. And that's a question. And this answer is going to come from Michael Klausecke, uh, probably. <clears throat> well, of course, Mr. Rogge has to make this statement because logistics companies are generally interested in buying transport production, if possible, at zero cost or at the lowest possible cost, no question. So, so a Eurovignette directive that would put um, the true cost, the true external cost um, of road transport, on road transport, of course, is, a, is, a, is, is, is not what they want to see in the place. Um, but I think if we look at, at what's happening in reality, the fact that prices, in fact, drive markets is very obvious. And if you don't put the right, right price take, uh, tag, uh, on, a, on a service, um, then obviously you, you will not find the result as you wish to find it. The, if you look at Switzerland, for example, the LSVA, um, the, the MAUT, uh, the road charge uh, scheme in Switzerland, which asks for a 40-ton truck to pay something like 60 euro cents per kilometer, um, has resulted in a strong reduction of empty drives of trucks something like 13% less empty drives of trucks, um, and has, 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 of course, also contributed to a modal shift from road to rail. So this seems to work. Um, and also, if you look at uh, another example where, for the, where a price tag has put on the use of roads, if you look at the congestion charge in London, um, as a car driver, you pay eight pounds per day to use the city's road with your car. The result is 25% less cars on the road. And the result is also for the individual motorist that he has a bit more of street available for himself. So it doesn't really resolve the problem as long as the money is not put into the alternative service. But, um, but this is something that is now happening in London. Now, um, 
I don't only want to counter your argument by, by saying prices are necessary, but I believe prices are necessary. I also hear your message that says there's still a lot of work to do in, in cross-border transport to improve the service quality of rail transport, and definitely that is the case. Yeah. We know it is happening, we know there are uh, directives for interoperable rail transport in the place now, we know that, of course, investment in the infrastructure and in... Uh, in uh, in trains, in locomotives, in wagons have to follow. And of course, this will take quite a lot of time, much more time than it takes for a new generation of trucks to come in place. Yeah? It's actually happening, but, uh, but I agree with you, we have to be impatient and we have to demand an acceleration of this kind of investment to improve cross-border service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have still two short shots. Uh, the gentleman over there and up there, please. Ich bin Stefan Schimming, Generalsekretär. My name is Stefan Schimming. I'm the Secretary General of OTIF in Bern. Some arguments that are used all the time are rather old. Both sides sometimes use this, uh, the old arguments. Mr. Kerber talked about the railway family, and that's what I would like to comment on. The railway family has a lot of, of um, bad apples, as it were. People say that infrastructure investment is too low, that the roads are not priced highly enough, that there is no aviation tax. But maybe you should look uh, in your own backyard, first of all, and look at the investment potential in your own industry. Where liberalization has pre proceeded, Competition from other countries uh, is avoided, and people have a lot of ideas to, to avoid competition from other countries. And even the ministries play a role in that. Access to the national network is restricted. There's a lot of misinterpretation of current EU legislation, or this legislation is not really used. If those kinds of practices were were stopped, then a lot could be done. If the national railways would stop pouring sand into each other's machinery, then uh, we could already harvest the fruit of infrastructure investment and would be competitive in comparison Thank you very with much. the roads. We have uh, to say goodbye to Mr. Lillenberger. He is such a desired person requested that he has to leave us because the next, uh, the next event is already waiting for him. Okay, Mr. Lillenberger, thank you very much for coming here. Yes, well, the, the modest will rule the world, okay? He'll be back tomorrow, what a promise. Okay, now we have got... Yes. And there's one short shop from there. Sh well, short the, piece. The, my name is Lou Thompson. I've been involved in railways all of my life in the U.S. and then around the world. The previous questioner just made my question a lot easier. If you look at the statistics, European EU 15 railways are carrying less freight, ton kilometers now, than they were 27 years ago. Less. They're barely carry, they've barely grown in the passenger traffic by less than 1% per year. And the share of freight traffic in European railway traffic has fallen from over half to about 40% now. Now, my question to you is, is this really an investment problem? What I've heard so far mostly is give us more money. This is a standard railway speech. I must have heard it in every railway in the world. Give us more money and we will haul more traffic. The question is what have you done to get that traffic? What are you doing for the... If you measure the percentage of railway traffic in the EU that is international, it has actually fallen in the last 10 years. That's surprising. It shouldn't have. The question is, what is the management model that has produced this behavior? And following your question about liberalization, what is the management model that would reverse it? 
And I think that's the key issue that has to be addressed, not just investment. We can all spend money. We can all spend money and buy things. But what do you need the capacity for? There's no more traffic now than there was then. What exactly is the railway industry in Europe doing to get traffic, to earn it, and to carry it rather than hoping that somebody will deliver it to them? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, well, a short quest answer to a long question, Mr. Claudecke. No, I don't think I can give an answer. I think this is a, a fair comment that has been put here in place. But I think we have to recognize that, uh, in particular, in Eastern Europe, we have a very specific situation. If you look back the last 10 years, we had a regulated market in Eastern, in Eastern European countries where something like 40 to 50 percent of the entire freight transport market was, uh, was on rail, and that was, uh, that was regulated by the governments like this. And of course, this high, very high market share has come down over the last decade, um, and that has heavily influenced European statistics. Um, as for Western Europe, um, we have a bit of a different picture, um, and this is what I cited uh, earlier, wherever liberalization has been, has been really put into place, uh, rail freight transport has grown enormously. Um, but I agree with you, um, rail freight by today has not, not at all um, used the potential that is still there with international transport. Yeah? International transport, of course, offers much more potential of, for growth for rail freight and as long as, uh, as uh, important markets have not been fully liberalized, as long as uh, the access to the rail infrastructure is not easily available for every operator, and as long as not a large number of operators have been newly established in all European countries, this will probably still take a while. Thank you. Okay, that will be then. Thank you very much. Subject of a new discussion in another round next year is going to come here. But now we come to the end. Michael Klauteke, Ebert von Körber, uh, um, uh, as well as uh, uh, Bert Clark and uh, 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 José Cardoso dos Reyes, thank you very much for participating and also for the public to listen to us to the end. But don't rush away. Uh, Dr. Ludwig is still to address the public here. Well, just thank you very a, much. As a small uh, uh, present, uh, I think we have here a, a small CD, you know, from a, a very young uh, ensemble here from Leipzig. A music, a mixture from the uh, 17th uh, century to the 20th century. By the way, also a good example of globalization because Mr. Bach, I think, who has been uh, spent most of his professional time here in Leipzig, I think, and what he has produced and what he has done has found its way into the rest, uh, I think, of the world. So a good example, I think, for what the railway still, I think, have to achieve and to do better maybe than in the past. So. Also here from CR and the International Transport Forum. Thank you very much to all the participants. And uh, we are looking, we have now a coffee break here. And then we are going, uh, I think, into the next round, discussing more in detail than how the railways, I think, what the last questions we have heard here, what could we do, I think, in order, I think, to have a better performance for rail in the years to come. Thank you very much.